Hello, everyone. Welcome to Gateway. So glad you're here with us today. I want to welcome everyone in the room, our Gateway family watching online in our Magnolia location. Let's give it up and welcome them. We love you. We're so grateful that all that God is doing here at Gateway Church. I want to encourage you, you just saw a video about uh, the night of worship tonight at 6 p.m. and baptisms. Obviously, if you've ever had that desire, hey, I want to go deeper into the presence of God, we set these set aside these nights for us to have an extended time of worship. There'll be a brief message, but it's really so we get in the presence of God together. And I want to also encourage you, if you have not been baptized, and you've committed your life to the Lord or rededicated your life, and you haven't been baptized since that, I want to encourage you to get baptized. It's a chance for us to go public with our faith and identify ourselves with Christ in baptism. So I want to encourage you. You can come tonight. Uh, you can obviously register. But even if you don't register, we'll have all everything you'll need so that you can be baptized. It's going to be an incredible night in the presence of the Lord. Well, I'm excited to start the second part of our series, The Real Jesus. And the focus of this series is really to talk about who he is, what, uh, what he does, his message, the mandate from heaven, the kingdom that he brought to the earth, and the message that uh, he gave to every single person. It's important that we know who Jesus is, because with anything in life, you will always live at the level of your revelation. And for some of us, that means we may have misplaced expectations of promises that Jesus never actually gave, but there may be some people here who also have settled for less than what God has for you, and you need to really understand who he is. And some of us have been at the place where we rejected a Jesus that we heard about, whether from our parents, professors, uh, peers, or even popular culture, and said, that's not the Jesus I want to follow. But if you are a follower of Christ, it's important that you know who you're following because you become like the person you follow. So this is what this series has really been about in the heart behind it. And we've been asking a question that Jesus asked in Matthew 16. It's important for us to have the, the answer to this question about who he, we say he is. In Matthew 16, starting in verse 15, it says this, then he asked them, talking to his disciples, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And we must all come to the place where we answer that question for ourselves. Our parents can't answer it for us. We have to come to the decision on our own, and this decision has eternal implications. And last week, I focused on the divinity of Jesus, who, that Jesus claimed to be God and that Jesus had a divine nature. And today, I want to focus on the humanity of Jesus. So that's today's message title, The Humanity of Jesus. Well, it's 2024. And that means uh, that many people are campaigning and the political campaigns that are happening. Uh, just so you know, I'm not going to talk about either of the candidates. So if you're ready to defend yourself, you can relax. That's not what this is going to be about. But I do want to talk about something that every single uh, candidate would do, and that's this idea of being strategic in identification. Here's what it looks like. They'll grab the cameras. They'll grab the crew. They'll go to a factory somewhere. They'll roll up their sleeves, they'll put on the hard hat, they'll have the goggles on, and they go there, and they simply say something along these lines. I know you, I'm one of you, I'm in your corner, and I understand you. Then they'll take all of that off after taking a few pictures and go to the next state and say, I know you, I understand you, I'm one of you, and I relate to you, and I understand you, and I'm in your corner, and here's why. Because they're wanting to win over support to their side for the ideas by relating and identifying. But truth be told, it's an illusion of identification. And I just want to say that God was not simply content with this idea or an illusion of identification. He wasn't concerned with just 15 minutes of fame. We're taking pictures and everyone coming to him. He actually became a human to connect with us, to truly identify with what we go through on a continuous basis. Because though he was divine and 100% God, he was also 100% fully human. And it's important to have correct doctrine. Doctrine is established teaching. It's like the skeleton of our body. It holds us up. It, it, it gives us a strong foundation. The trouble can be when we get into dogma or being dogmatic in the way that I describe that as established opinions. And here's how you can know when you have correct doctrine. 
It's whenever it leads you to the place where you love God more and you love people more, not less. If you get to the place where you say, I, I just have this doctrine and it leads you to hating people, then you haven't actually received the doctrine the, the way that God wanted you to receive it because he actually says, you'll know that they are my disciples by the way that they have love for one another. And this doctrine that we want to talk about of his humanity connects us to God. But here's what it says in Philippians 2, 7. It says this, instead, speaking of Jesus, he gave up his divine privileges. He did not give up his divinity, but his divine privileges in the way that he limited himself as a human. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. And I just want this phrase for us to really be able to lay it out. It says, Jesus is one person with two natures, the divine nature that he shares equally and eternally with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and the human nature that he assumed in his incarnation. Because here's what you need to know. There's the truth of Jesus' humanity is as significant to the gospel as the truth of his divinity. Both of them are equally important. You can't separate the two. They both have to come together. And this is the way the apostle John actually tells us in 1 John 4. It says, this is how you can recognize the spirit of God. So if you've ever wondered if someone has the spirit of God, every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. So there will be an Antichrist, but anyone who actually says Jesus didn't actually come in the flesh, it was just an appearance or he appeared as a human, but he actually wasn't a human and there are thoughts that people are sharing that are along that, those lines. They're saying that's actually not a spirit that comes from God because the spirit that comes from God says, I understand that Jesus became a human being. So since he became a human being, the thing that we need to ask ourselves is why did he do it? Why, why did he do it? Did he do it for his sake or did he do it for our sake? Obviously, I believe he did it for our sake but here's why I believe. It's so that he can understand us. And I want to have three points today about what Jesus understands as it relates to us so that we can put this together about who he truly is. And here's the first thing. Jesus understands relationships. Jesus understands relationships. Everywhere that Jesus went, if you read through the Gospels, there were people that were constantly around him. People that weren't like them, sinners actually loved being around Jesus. They outcast, the marginalized, they loved being around Jesus. So Jesus understands relationships. I want to give a little bit of background of Jesus. Jesus was born in Judah uh, to a Jewish family. Uh, Jesus lived a Jewish lifestyle, and he was born under the Jewish law. He was born under the law, Galatians 3 tells us. He grew up in a town called Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was one of those places that did not have a good reputation. This is why that one disciple asked, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I don't know if you've grown up in a town that's like nothing good comes out of that, but here's what Jesus is saying. Well, at least one good thing came out of Nazareth, and the truth is at least one good thing came out of where you're from too because you're here, okay? But he, he, this is how he grew up. Nazareth was considered despised. It was considered lowly. It was where people went with it that had the stigma of being rejected, and that's the place where Jesus came from. So it wasn't necessarily anything to be proud about. He took on humility in the place where he grew up. But Jesus also knows all about family relationships. See, Jesus knows what it means to be born. He knows what it means to be a toddler. He knows what it means to be a teenager. He knows what it means to go through that awkward season as a teenager where you go through puberty. I know many people may not think about it, but Jesus went through this because he was a human. He grew. He would have gone to school. He probably would have been the teacher's favorite in the valedictorian of his class, getting all of his answers right, okay? This is who Jesus potentially would have been. Uh, Jesus was a person who would have probably done some chores around the house. Uh, Luke 2.40 tells us this. It said, there, the child grew up healthy and strong. He was filled with wisdom, and God's favor was on him. Luke 2.52, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature, and in favor with God and all the people. 
See, many times we don't think about Jesus growing. He, he grew. He learned. Uh, his, his, obviously, his body grew as well. Uh, he knows what it's like to have brothers and sisters. I'm, I'm one of five. I have one older brother, three younger sisters. God decided to stick me right there in the middle of the second born. I feel like I just, like most second borns, I feel like I should have been the first born. I don't know if there's any second borns out there that are like that. But that's the way I think. But he had a, four brothers, and they would say he had at least two sisters. So he understood what it was like to have uncles, aunts, cousins. John the Baptist was actually his cousin. Uh, he knows what it's like to have problems in your family. I don't know if anyone here has problems in their family. Maybe some other churches, but not here, okay? No, we all have problems in our family. The family that we hang out with for Thanksgiving and Christmas, and those two times are pretty much too much throughout the year. But we all have the, those things in our family. As a matter of fact, most of Jesus' family did not actually believe in who he was until after the resurrection happened. They actually tried to stop him and get him away. Matter of fact, in Mark 3, verse 31, is one of those instances. He said, then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him. They stood outside and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus, and someone said, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Jesus replied, who is my mother and who are my brothers? I'm sure Mary was not very happy to hear that phrase. Okay, that question isn't something she was joyful about. He said, then he looked at those around him and said, look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. So they are saying in this moment, hey, Jesus, your family's here. And he's like, that's not my family. Y'all are my family. He's saying there's a spiritual family. I know there's, we probably have grown up and hopefully you have that friend who kind of is like, they're not family, but they're basically family. I don't know if you have those. It's the phrases that we use are, it's my brother from another mother or a sister from another mister. Either one of those goes. I don't know if that's right. But we all have that connection with people who are like family. And Jesus is saying that in the same way. Here's another thing you need to understand is that Jesus understands what it's like to be single. He understands that. There's, there's purpose in your singleness. And on the earth, he was single and still carried out the mission and plan for his life. So if you're single here today, there's nothing wrong with you. God has, still has a purpose and a plan and a destiny for your life, even as you may desire to be married. But Jesus understood what it was like to be single on Valentine's Day, okay? He would understand what that feeling is like when everyone else is going out and celebrating love. He would understand that. But on the other side is Jesus also understands what it means to be married. Jesus has a bride, and he is a groom. The church is the bride of Christ. But on the other side of it, Jesus also understands what it means for his bride to be unfaithful. He understands what it means for uh, us to go astray and not desire to be connected with him. Jesus also knows what it means to have friends. Uh, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha were some of his closest friends, if you read through the scriptures. This is why they were so upset when Jesus wasn't there, when Lazarus died. And both of uh, Mary and Martha, they both said, Lord, if you had only been here. But that would be a place that he would visit very often. He had disciples who were his close friends, Peter, James, and John. And even though they were his close friends, he felt the abandonment at the time of his greatest hardship. He understands what it's like to be betrayed by those that are closest to him. Here's what... If you aren't going to get it today, I'm going to just tell you my point in this entire message is that Jesus understands. He understands what you're going through because he took on humanity. He knows what it's like to be rejected by people. I just want to say, if Jesus is perfect and he was rejected by people, how in the world do we think that we are going to be accepted by everyone when he was perfect and we are not? You're not here to please everybody. You're ultimately here to please God. And be in relationship with him. Yes, we love every single person, but that may not necessarily mean that we please are pleasing to them and we're friends with them. But he knows what it means to have relational issues. So the question for us is, do we go to him whenever we have problems in our relationships, in our marriage, with our kids? Do we go to him because he understands what it's like and he can help you in that? So that's the first thing Jesus understands. The second thing Jesus understands is work. Jesus understands work. Work is actually a gift from God. My hope is that you understand that. Work was in the scriptures before the fall. Adam was given tasks. He was given an assignment. Adam and Eve were. 
after the fall is actually when work got hard. That's what happened in that moment. But work is a gift from God. And I know sometimes this shocks people, especially as they enter the workforce. But whenever you get to work, they actually require you to work. I know that's a shocker sometimes. They didn't hire you so you can grab some coffee and hang out by the water cooler. That's not. They, they expect you to get to work just as a pastor want to help you out. But think of this thought. The creator became the creation and worked. He took on humanity. He took on flesh. See, from the very beginning of time, Jesus was a builder. From the very beginning. But the question I have for you, do you think he's still a builder? Of course he is. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's building his church, but he also would love to build a lot, the life of a person who's willing to give their life to him. He will build your life. He will help you with the plans and purposes that he has for you. Jesus is still a builder. Here's actually what they said about him in Mark 6.3. It said, then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. That's not Judas that betrayed him, by the way just in case you don't know. So those are his brothers, and it says his sisters live right here among us. So that's how we know he has sisters. They were deeply and offended and refused to believe in him. So Jesus, in their eyes, was just a carpenter. But here's what I want to say to you. Just because someone else doesn't see your value doesn't mean God doesn't see your value. They considered him just a carpenter, but obviously he was so much more. When people come up to me and they say, well, I'm, I'm just a teacher. I'm like, you're not just anything. You're not just a doctor. You're an extension of the healing hands of Jesus. You're not just a lawyer. You're meant to help right the wrongs and injustices that are here in this world. You're not just a mother or a father. You're here to raise up the next generation. You have a purpose and a calling at every single place that you are, and you can make a difference if you would see it and step into it confidently. But they missed who Jesus was because they saw him as just a carpenter in this moment. But Jesus was a hard worker. And I'm not saying carpentry isn't hard work today, but he did it without any power tools, guys. He did it without any power tools, just his regular old tool belt. Maybe he wore some overalls. I don't know. But there wasn't a nail gun that he could use. There wasn't a power saw for, for cutting. He did not have that. Uh, he would build and fix tables and chairs. And people probably, he had a lot of business in his business because he just made everything perfectly and no one could ever return anything because it was made so well. But Jesus was a carpenter. And here's the truth. You need to catch this. That Jesus knows what it's like to be in the marketplace because he was in the marketplace longer than he was actually in ministry. See, so many times we can try to separate our faith on Sunday from the rest of our week thinking God doesn't understand what it's like to be in the marketplace to work a job, but he understands this. He understands where you are so we can come to him in those moments. You may not have this image of Jesus, but since he worked with his hands, he may have had blisters. I assume they're callous. So many times we think Jesus is just this tender, meek and mild person. He is meek, but he was actually strong. To do this work back then, he would actually be a very strong person. So this is who Jesus is. Uh, as much as he was about his earthly father's business, he was also about his heavenly father's business. At 12 years old, they, they go to the temple, and they were there for several days in the caravan, began to head back home, and they realized that Jesus wasn't with them. Uh, I don't know if you've ever lost a child before. It's a very terrifying feeling. I remember one time my daughter, Kate, around the house many times, we play hide and seek, and typically I let them hide for, four, for five or so minutes before I go and find them because I need a little bit of a break, but that's okay. But they got really good at hiding, and that's great when you're at home, but it's not great when you're at the mall. And we were at the mall one day, we were shopping. I'm, more, I'm not a shopper, I'm a buyer. Uh, Elaine was shopping, and I was walking along with her. Uh, there's a difference between the two. If you don't know the difference, ask somebody, okay? But we were there, and we were, we were about to leave the store. And I always do a count, one, two, three, four. We have four kids, one, two, three, four, and number two was missing. Yes, that's Kate, okay? Sometimes we just number them. It's much faster, okay? Just go with me. 
And we realized that she's gone. So we're looking everywhere. I go out into the hall to look, make sure she didn't wander the mall, make sure nothing uh, bad happened. And the next thing we know, in the midst of all this, we hear giggling coming from a clothes rack. I was like, hey, good job hiding. Let's never do that again, okay? But you, we all had that feeling we may have lost a child. Okay, what do you think Joseph and Mary felt when they lost the Messiah? How do you explain that one to God? Hey, God, do you have any messiahs laying around anywhere that you can sit? They carried the weight of that. And it says they went back, uh, and they went back a day's journey. It was three days later they found Jesus in the temple. And here's Jesus' response to them and why he didn't come with them. He said, I must be about my father's business. Didn't you know that? He was about his father's business, and the people were astounded and amazed at his teaching because he spoke with such authority. This is one of the stories we have of when Jesus was younger in the first 30 years of his life. So he was a part of his father's business. He was passionate about his father's house. See, in John chapter 2, another image of Jesus that we see is one who cleared the temple. I don't know if that image of Jesus is in your head that there, was, there were people who were extorting uh, and basically making a mockery of the temple by merchandising and overcharging people. And Jesus saw this as he went to the temple, and it actually says he stepped away and made a whip. I don't know if that sinks in your head for a second. I imagine the disciples are all gathered around and say, hey, what's happening? It's like Jesus looks a little bit upset. It's like he is upset. Is he making a whip? Why, what is he making that whip for? And Jesus, who knows all of our thoughts and ideas, is you're going to find out why I made this whip in a second, okay? And then he goes to the temple, and it says he drives them out because greed and God don't mix. So if you're going to worship God, it has to be from a pure heart. And he clears them out with a whip and throws over the tables. But this is Jesus. Like, he, he's strong. He's tough. Obviously, when it's righteous anger, he carried it out in righteousness, but he was angry whenever people did not treat his father's house correctly. And here's what the disciples said they remembered in John 2, 17. It said, his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Zeal or passion for your house, this is what consumed Jesus. See, we are so focused many times on what we consume, but do we pay attention to what consumes us? And is it in alignment with what consumes Jesus? Remember, we're, if you're a follower of Christ, you need to be aligned with his desires for your life. See, I don't know if, I know there may be some people, we have some meal preppers, they prep uh, for their entire week. I don't know if we have some, do we have any meal preppers here? One Sunday, you know, oh yes, that is incredible. I want to say that I admire everyone who does that. I'm going to eat something different every single day. That's just the way it's going to be for me. But here's what they do. They will measure out exactly, make sure the protein, the micros, the macros have everything there. I don't even know if they're able to eat dessert, but don't worry. I'm eating enough dessert so there's a balance, and it's balancing out in the long run, okay? But they're focusing on the amount that they are consuming. But I want to come to the other side of it and say, are you focusing on what's actually consuming you? Is envy consuming you? Is entitlement, pride, what's consuming your time, what's consuming your energy, your effort? What are you passionate about? Remember, it says, zeal for your house has consumed me. What is consuming your life? Because it needs to align with the same thing that consumed Jesus, and that is his father's house to be a part of the kingdom of God and carry out what he's called for every single one of us to do. So he was consumed with his father's work. See, Jesus was a person who understood works. The question is, are we going to bring our work to him? Are we going to bring our business to him? Are we going to bring the questions about the careers and the jobs that we have? See, when we work, we work as unto God, not unto man. And so are we going to bring that to him? Because I just want to tell us Jesus understands work. And here's the third and final thing that I believe he understands that we're going to talk about today. Let me say it that way. Jesus understands pain. Jesus understands pain. For those of you who have ever wanted to memorize a scripture verse, I'm going to help you out. It's going to be very simple. John 11:35 says Jesus wept. There you go. You memorized the scripture. Congratulations. But I want you to hear the weight of that. 
the creator and sustainer of the universe, wept with his creation. So many times we could look, overlook things that Jesus had emotional pain. He would have had mental pain. He would have had physical pain. And Isaiah 53 is a messianic prophecy pointing to Jesus. But look at the words of what's written, and you can see the emotional pain, the physical pain that he was going to face, and even the mental pain. Isaiah 53, 3 says this, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. Does that sound like emotional pain to anyone else? We turn our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. See, Jesus understood what it meant to experience emotional pain, but he used the beauty of it. Even though he went to his own and he was rejected, Jesus was rejected so that we could actually be accepted by God. We can find acceptance in our relationship with him. He experienced emotional pain. He also experienced physical pain in verse 5 of Isaiah 53. It says, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. See, he endured physical pain. He also endured mental pain. If you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane as he was heading to the cross and he knew it was coming up, it actually says his soul was troubled. Our soul is comprised of our mind, our will, and our emotions. He's saying our, our soul is troubled. So he brought some friends along with them to pray for him. And Peter, James, and John fell asleep several times because they're horrible prayer partners and Jesus needs some better intercessors, okay? But they fall asleep and he's in anguish to the point where he's sweating blood. This is the type of description of what Jesus went through in his soul as he was wrestling in this moment. And he comes to the place where he says, not my will, but yours be done. And he lays down and surrenders his will. It's a picture of what we can do even in the middle of great mental pain. But in verse 7 of Isaiah 53, it says, He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as, sheep, as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. See, Jesus knew pain. He understood what it meant for people to make fun of his vocation. He understood what it meant for people to ridicule his hometown. He, he knew what it was like to be born in a lowly place in a stable. He knows what it means to be rejected, to be abandoned, to be tired, to be thirsty. But he also knows what it's like to live in a fallen world with the devil as your enemy. And while he didn't sin, he knows what you're going through, the temptations that you may face, the hardships that you may be going through, the pressure of life that is on you, and he loves you in the middle of that pain, the shortcomings, and the failures. Because he cares for you. Hebrews 2.14, the last scripture through 18. It says, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, which means that humanity died, not his divinity. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. I love it said, had the power of death because of Jesus' resurrection. He now has all power. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. He's saying in this moment, you don't have to be a slave to the fear of dying. So many of the phobias and fears that we have in this world are actually connected to dying, whether it's a fear of snakes, fear, fear of heights, whatever it may be. A fear of snakes, what you're, you're not just scared of the snakes, you're scared of getting bit, bitten by a poisonous snake and dying, right? You're not just scared of heights, you're scared of falling down from a high place and dying. There are some phobias that I, I didn't know about that I actually learned in my life. Whenever I lived in Dallas, probably 16 or so years ago, I was single at the time and I had several different roommates. And after a church service, a bunch of friends were coming over to our house. We all left at the same time. And we all got there and 15 to 20 minutes later, a person who was invited to the party came in. I was living in Dallas at the time. Uh, on a, it was a 15, it was an apartment, but it had 15 floors. This detail is important. And I lived on the 13th floor. So we're all there. We're, we're having fun. And then a person comes in, and they're sweating. And they're tired. They're breathing a little bit deeply. And we're all wondering what happened. We were making sure that this person was okay. And then we realized she, she came in there, and she said, I, I have a phobia of elevators. 
y'all, she walked 13 stories to get to our apartment. So she was just tired. I don't know if there's anyone else here who shares that. That was a day that I learned that you have a phobia of, of elevators. And I was young at the time, and the group around me that was young and foolish, and were like, hey, we're going to help you overcome this phobia today. And we're all going to get in the elevator together. We're going to ride with you. We're here to support you. And here's what happened. As soon as we all got in the elevator, because of the weight, the elevator shifted. It was not helpful. It was like, we're going to help you overcome your fears by making you more fearful, okay? And eventually, in the midst of her screaming and fighting against it, like I said, it wasn't the wisest thing to do. We made it to the floor, and I still, to this day, don't think she's ever gotten on an elevator again. She just take the steps. But ultimately, she was, had a fear that the, somehow the elevator shaft would just fall to the ground, and she would die. So we all can be slaves for the fear of dying, but on the other side, of understanding who Jesus is because he came in the flesh and he was raised from the dead. We should not be bound for fear of dying anymore. We should not be slaves to this, that we have the victory. It says, we also know in verse 16 that the son did not come to help angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Since he himself has gone through suffering, if you've ever felt like you've suffered or are testing, Jesus understands he's been through that. And he is able to help us when we are being tested. So you need to know that in the middle of the testings, in the middle of the sufferings, in the middle of the pain that you're going through, he understands, but he's able to help you through it. He's able to help you get to the other side of it. But we need to understand we have a high priest that sympathizes with our weakness. He doesn't criticize us for our weakness. So then why are we so critical of ourselves? Why are we so critical of other people? Our high priest is not judgmental. As a matter of fact, his throne is called a throne of grace, which means he's willing to give you what you don't deserve. See, the Bible is not about karma. If you ever thought, it's like, that person got what they deserve. Okay, that's not what the scripture says. Grace means you don't deserve it. It's unmerited. You don't deserve it, yet God still lavishes his love on you if you're willing to receive it. So will you come to Jesus with your hurts, your pains, and your fears and find rest for your soul? Because this is what he promises to those who come to him. But he also understands death. And I'm not talking about his death. I'm also ta- I'm talking about a family's death. Member's death. If you remember, we read it earlier, and here's what it actually said. When it said his family was waiting outside for him, and it said, your mother and your brothers are waiting outside for you. It didn't say his father was waiting outside for him. And even at the cross, whenever Jesus is on the cross, he points to John and talks to John and Mary and says for Mary, his mother, to go home with John because Jesus, as the oldest son, would be the one responsible for his mother. Many people believe that Joseph died. His father died. And Jesus understands what it's like to comfort people who are grieving, to sit by his mother while she's crying. I remember part of the scripture and even this point whenever my father died in 2018 and I went back home and I was with my mom and I was with my family comforting them. See, Jesus understands this, and he could have raised his father from the dead, but he didn't. Jesus understands what we're going through, even in the midst of the greatest suffering, losing the ones that we love, losing the life that we may have even loved. Jesus understands pain, and he wants to walk with you through it, and he wants to help you through it. You are not in a hopeless place when you are following Jesus. You have a high priest who loves you and would love to step into those areas of your life that you may have blocked off, but he can bring healing to that place if you would allow him to because he understands pain. See, because of his divinity, Jesus can save you. But it's because of his humanity that Jesus understands you. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. And at the end of every single service, we ask a simple yet profound question. What is the Holy Spirit saying to me through this message? We're all at different places of our lives. We're all at different places where of our understanding of who Jesus is. And my hope is that today that Jesus was a human, that he went through what we went through, that he's able to sympathize and connect with us. 
And today, we want to respond. In a moment, one more worship song, we're going to go into a song, but there's also going to be a prayer team up here as we go and sing this final worship song. And if you need prayer for anything at all, we want to pray with you. Don't leave today with the same burdens that you came in with. Whether it pertains to this message or you're going through something else, a family issue, a financial issue, issue with your kids or your health, whatever it is, we want to pray because we believe that there is power in prayer. But this week, you need to know that God is in your corner, that God is for you, that he loves you. You don't have to struggle alone while you're at work. You don't have to struggle alone while you're in your pain. He promises to be with you, and he's put a church around you to strengthen you whenever you are weak. But there may be one more group of people here that would say, hey, now that I have a greater understanding of who he is and his humanity, I need to make him my Lord and Savior. I want to make a decision today to follow after him, to be more like who he is, to repent of my sins, which simply means to change your mind. I'm not going my own way. I'm willing to surrender my life to Jesus today and believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. And because of that, I don't have to have the fear of dying anymore. But if you're here today and you're in that group and you know, and God's been speaking to you and you say, I need to make Jesus my savior. I need a savior. I need to have forgiveness of my sins. In a moment here, I'm gonna pray a prayer. And if you're here today and you would say, as you pray that prayer, Ethan, count me in. Count me in on that prayer. I wanna make Jesus my Lord and Savior. Would you just do something right now? Would you just raise your hand? And you can raise it high. It's not the prayer that saves us, but it's the heart that's willing to be committed to him. Just raise it. You can leave it raised. I see hands all up all, up all over this place. Raise your hand high. We, this is the best decision that you can ever make to choose to follow Jesus because of Jesus is a God who understands us. Is there anyone else who would say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to make him my Lord and Savior today. You can put your hand down. But I want you to pray this prayer in your heart. Lean in at this moment because I believe that God has something special for us, that he's going to do a work in your life, that he's going to make you new. So just say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace and mercy, that you've given me what I did not deserve, that you sent your son to the earth to live a life that I could not live and died a death that I do deserve. I ask right now, and I say and confess with my mouth that you, Jesus, are the Son of God, that you are raised from the dead. And because of that, I can receive forgiveness of my sins. Thank you for giving your life so that I can experience new life. And from this day forward, I commit to following you to loving you, and to putting my trust and faith in you. And I thank you for that right now. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said...